Welcome! Today we'll be learning about the basics of scenic painting. My name is Gary Hoff. I am the Head of Design Resident Scenic Designer for the Nashville Repertory Theater. And myself, along with Philip Frank from Vanderbilt University, will be showing you some easy techniques for scenic painting. Now, we'd love to see what you do with this, so after you're done, if you could send us pictures, that would be awesome. Please send them to my email address, gary at nashvillerep.org. We look forward to seeing you, and hopefully we can put your stuff online so others can see your work. Now let's get started. So to start, let's talk about materials and hardware that you're going to need for painting. Um, some of you may have been painters before and understand all those things, so let's run them through just so everybody knows what we're talking about. Um, first of all, let's talk about rollers. Um, rollers are a great thing when you're doing a large project, something nice and flat, like a floor or flats, something that doesn't have a lot of, of texture and detail to it. Rollers are the way to go. So this is called a roller pan. This is what you put your paint in. Um, and sometimes you can also have what's called a roller liner. Um, what this does is help you clean up. Um, it helps you keep your roller pan, pan clean. You don't need one of these, but um, it actually is a really cool thing to have if you can, um, if you can have one. Um, these are called roller pads. Now roller pads come in a number of different styles and, and um, sizes. Um, so this is the fairly standard size. Um, and this is what I would use normally. Now if I'm painting something that has a really strong texture to it, I'd probably do something like this, which has a much longer nap to it. Um, and can get paint into much deeper and um, more crevice kind of painting. Um, this is called a roller frame. Um, as you can see, it turns. Um, the roller goes on like so. Make sure it's really well seated. Um, something people don't really know is that under the bottom of the roller is actually a place where you can screw in a handle. So if you're doing something that you need a longer reach, you can use a roller handle. Um, if you're doing a floor, then you can actually put in a really long one, like a broom handle, which actually will screw in just as well. So um, if you have a reach problem, don't be afraid to use put the handle in. Now there's smaller versions as well, and the, the frame looks something like this. And again, these come in a variety of different kinds. There's um, this kind that's got a, a nap to it. There's also foam kind. And they're pretty easy. They just slip right in. And this is good for small projects where you want to get to something, get it covered pretty quickly. Um, but it works really, really well. Um, as far as cleaning, um, always clean out your, your, bro your roller as much as possible. Um, sometimes it's not going to be possible, so if it doesn't, you can throw it away. But um, one of the things that a lot of people don't know is this little tool actually cleans a roller. Um, that's what it's designed for. It's a multi-tool, but that curve actually fits the roller. So once you're done, and this is full of paint, you can scrape it down and scrape the paint back into your bucket. Um, so especially if you have like specialty paint or paint that's uh, uh, specialty mixed for a show, you don't want to waste it. So what you want to do is scrape it all off back into the bucket before you clean it, and that will be make your cleaning a lot easier. One tool that you can use is called a spinner, and a spinner is actually using centrifugal force to push the paint out of the roller. Now it's specifically designed for the roller to fit in, just like that. It's kind of a ratchet, where you push it, and it rolls. So as you roll it and run it under water, centrifugal force will push the paint out of the roller, and that's probably the cleanest you're going to get it. But this also will do paint brushes. It's got a little clip in the top, and it does the same thing. It spins the paint out of the brush. Now you're going to need to open your paint, so often you will see something that looks like this. This is often referred to as a church key. So if somebody says, oh, get the church key, that's what they're talking about. I mean, it opens up cans. It'll also, because it's got those little two little prongs, can open up bottles. So it's kind of a multi-use tool. Now if you're using big buckets, five gallon buckets, this little tool will help you open the top. You push it under the lid and pull up around. It'll save your hands. It's a really good tool. Now brushes. 
Now, we've probably all seen brushes. These are pretty standard brushes, and people often wonder, how expensive do I need to go? And my response to that is, as expensive as you can afford. Um, obviously, the better quality brush will give you a better quality product, but it doesn't mean it's the only way to get a really good product. Um, brushes are really expensive these days. They're really, really expensive. I often will use a nylon brush. Uh, a natural hair brush actually is probably a little better, but they're really expensive. So you can do, you can get the same effect with a nylon brush as you can with a with a um, natural hair brush. But um, like I said, if you can afford more, get more. Um, these are the basic styles of brush. These are the flat topped brushes. They come in different widths, um, and they can come very very wide to very small. Always pick the brush that's going to give you the most coverage um, for your product. Don't try to do a big product with a little brush and don't try to do a little project with a big brush. Try to find your brush that's going to fit your project. Um, this is called a sash brush and as you notice it's got an angle to it. And what that does is help you get into corners. So you can get right close to something in a corner or around something. Um, which is why they was called that because it painted on the sashes of windows. Um, so that's a good brush if you're trying to get into small places or next to moldings. Um, we also have the foam brushes. Now these are like more craft brushes. Um, I don't use these very often. They're, they're pretty, um, uh, they fall apart pretty easily. Um, but there are some uses that they, that they do work well for, so don't forget them. Um, they can work for you. These are called stencil brushes. Um, and as you can see, they have a flat top to them. And the way you use these is you have a little um, pan of paint you tap it in the paint, you tap it off, and then with a stencil, you tap the paint on around the stencil. Um, this is very, very time consuming. Rarely ever use these. Um, but something to know. Simple artist brushes. There's artist brushes of all shapes and sizes. Don't be afraid to use them um, because you really want the brush that's the size of what you need it for. So don't be afraid to use a small brush when you need a small brush. Um, these come in a variety of sizes. You can find them at pretty much anywhere. Now these are the higher end brushes. These are called scenic paint brushes. Um, and these are a natural natural hair brush. Um, this is what a scenic painter, if you found a, like a real scenic painter, um, that I am not really, even if Philip says I am. Um, this He's is lying. What you, He's lying. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm really not. Um, but this is what they would use, is, is, is a true scenic paint brush. Um, I use these rarely. They're very expensive. And um, they do work really well, but you don't want to ruin them. So um, very sparingly. So if you see these, please ask before you use them um, because they do cost a lot of money. Um, what I use a lot is called a chip brush. Um, and these you can get pretty much everywhere. And they're the least expensive brush you can find, which makes it really good because you're not worried about spending too much money or if you forget and it paint dries in it, it's not that big a deal to throw these away. Um, I use these for a whole lot of things, and in some of our um, demonstrations today, I will be using a chip brush. Um, some fun tools, and we might get, a, get to show you this one. This is called a grainer, um, and this will give a wood grain. I know it doesn't look like it will, but it actually does. So I, we'll, we'll, we'll show you that in a, in a little bit. Um, some other tools you're going to need. Masking tape. Um, to mask out areas you don't want painted, masking paper. Um, you can use any kind of paper, but this kind of paper you can actually get at um, Home Depot or Lowe's or paint stores to, to mask out areas you don't want painted. Um, sometimes, because you'd be dealing with large quantities, they'll dry and get chunks in them. Um, so it's a good idea to strain it. And a simple kitchen strainer, this one obviously has been well used and loved, um, you can strain your paint out. So everyone, you know, if, if it gets too chunky, if there's too many pieces in it, um, you can strain your paint. Now, as far as types of paint, um, I normally use a standard household paint. Um, it's easy to get. It's You can mix, have it mixed in many, many colors. Um, it's easy to work with. It's water soluble. Always remember to look at the label to make sure it's a latex paint and not an oil paint. If you get an oil paint, first of all, you're going to notice a really distinct smell. It's going to smell different. It has kind of an oily feel to it, obviously, because it's oil. 
what it doesn't do is wash out. You have to use a thinner or, or some kind of solvent to get rid of it. So if you, if you open up a can and it smells really funny, check the label. If it says oil, stop. Make sure that's what you're supposed to be using. There are very, very small circumstances where that's the case. Don't use it unless you need to use it. Um, the other kind of paint is called a scenic paint. Um, and most people use um, the Roscoe brand. Um, there are a few other brands. Um, and this is a really high concentrated paint where you can water it down and create different levels of paint with it and use it as a mixing agent with other paints. Um, this is fairly expensive and I don't use this very often. Um, I, less and less as the years go on. Um, it's just, it doesn't seem to work that well for me. Um, but that's also an option is scenic paint. Um, and that, that is something that's a specialty item that you have to get from a company that actually sells, sells theatrical um, type products. Of course there's spray paints. There's your traditional spray paint. Um, I'm particularly fond of the 2X brand from Rust-Oleum. I think it works really well. You can get this at um, Walmart or Home Depot. Um, and uh, so that's that's your spray paint. Again, not water soluble. So if you're you know going to use this, make sure you know that it's not going to wash out. Um, so you may want to use gloves. Simple latex gloves are a great way to keep your hands clean um, while you're working. Um, I'll mention that more as we do other tutorials of when I I like to use gloves and not use gloves. Um, but it's always up to you whether you want to use gloves. Another kind of spray paint. It's called Design Master. Um, Design Master is a specialty kind of spray paint, specifically made to paint fabric. Um, it was originally designed to paint um, silk flowers. Um, but you can use it on a whole number of things. And the really nice thing about Design Master is it has a translucent quality to it. So you can get a nice um, translucent feel to your paint. Um, and this works really well, but it is much more expensive than normal spray paint. So you've got to use it really sparingly. Um, so that's all our basic items. So why don't we get started on some techniques of how to use these things. Base painting. Now base painting is something that probably everybody that first starts in a shop is going to have to do. And most people think it's a torture and you're being punished. Well maybe you are. But it's a really important step and it's really important that you do it well. The thing about base painting is it determines how well the finished product is going to look. It's the foundation. So what you want is a really, really good, clean, even coat of paint. Now, people ask, what color do I base paint? Well, what you want is the, the I see usually use the, the kind of the medium shade of whatever I want the finished product to look like. So I can go darker and lighter with anything over top of it. Um, but that's totally up to you. So we're going to I'm going to show you there's two basic ways to do it. You can do it with a brush. Um, and what you want is to make sure whatever tool you use is the best tool to get the job done quickly. Um, so if you have something with a lot of corners and edges and uh, a lot of places to get into, you're going to want to use a brush. So you want to load your brush. Get the excess off. And what's a good idea is to paint in, in an X. Because what you want is, um, and you don't want to create any kind of pattern or anything you can tell looks like anything. So you want to keep your arm moving and paint in an X. But what's really important is what I call laying off. What you need to do is make sure you don't have any drips, any puddling. You want a nice, even flat. So once you get it all on, with barely any pressure on the brush, lay it off. See, I did it pretty thick there. Lay it off. Because you want a really uniform, flat, so keep your wrist moving, 
the text pattern, when you're laying off, you're using longer strokes, it looks like. Exactly. Yeah, what you want to yeah. do is get it as smooth as you can without creating any kind of pattern. So that's the way you do with the brush. Now, if you're working with a really large area, you might want to use a roller. Now, this is good for floors or flats that don't have a lot of molding or, or windows or doors. Um, so a roller is a really good way to, to um, cover for base painting. And the same kind of technique basically goes. Um, but more than an X, what you want to do is a W. So what that does is that creates a nonlinear feel to it. Um, again, you want to you want to be very even. You want to be very um, consistent across your whole piece, um, and you don't want any lines or drips or puddling. So make sure you're really even. You can use them in combination. You can do if you have. You can do a bunch of it with the roller, great, and then come in with the brush and finish off the areas you can't get to with a roller, like a corner. Um, so you can use both, depending on what you want to use. Um, but a roller is just a really good way to create a large, large area. But remember, this is a really important step, um, so don't think of it as just a torture, um, but actually a really important part of the process. And whoever is doing the final painting, you either be you or someone else will appreciate that you took the time to do your base painting well. So that is base painting. Um, you will base paint pretty much everything. Most everything will start off with a base coat, um, which gives you a nice surface to work on for your final um, look, your final treatment. Um, so base painting. Scumbling, I know, fun word. Scumbling is really to create an overall pad up texture of a, of a, on your set by using a multiple set of colors. Um, I'm going to use two colors, um, but you can use as many colors as you want. Um, this works really well for um, a sky. Um, this is just a lot of uses you can do. Now you're going to want a brush for each of your colors. Can't use one brush. And what you're going to want to do, as normal, just kind of layer, get most of the paint off your brush. And what you want to do is kind of create random shapes. Just very random. And so with your second color, You kind of want to fill in, but you don't really want to get absolutely right up to your other color. So with a dry brush that's fairly soft, so soft that is, very lightly what you want to do is, is um, blend these colors together. But what you want, don't want to do is make it just one mishy, mashy color. You want some variation. So very lightly moving your hand, you want to blend your colors together. So this is more of an all over effect. But as you see, I'm trying not to get rid of the yellow because the stronger color is the orange. And often I'll I want to get rid of any excess paint on my dry brush. Now, would you ever use this as a base for something else? Absolutely. This is a good base. If you if you have the time to do it, this is a great base to do a, a wood floor. Mm. Um, and so you can do techniques over top of this, but it gives you a nice modeled look. And again, you kind of want to keep working at it so you don't have any areas that aren't well blended. And keep a really light hand on your brush. You don't want to be 
too strong-handed with this. So that's what you're going to get, is an overall kind of model look. Again, you can keep working at it. Um, so that's what you kind of want, an all-over kind of model look. Now you can use as many colors as you want to do this, um, but the more colors, the harder it's going to be to get a good, nice blend between the colors. Um, so this is scumbling. Um, so again, fun word. Um, use it in parties. Uh, but this is a nice way to create a nice model look. Um, and then you can use it as is, or you can put other put things over top of it um, to use as a base for some of your, your product. So that is scumbling. Gradient. Now, like the scumble that we, saw, we used earlier, this is also kind of a wet-on-wet -wet technique um, where you want to blend shades in together. But what you want in this is to do it in levels as opposed to an all-over look. What you want is a gradient from a light to a dark. Now, I'm going to do it in uh, three shades of one color, but if you're doing, say, a sky, you could do it from yellow to orange to red to purple to blue, um, and that would also be a gradient. Um, so what is this? The smooth transition from one shade to the other shade, so it looks imperceptible, like it's just getting lighter. Now again, you're going to want a different brush for each color, and I like to use these chip brushes. So we'll lay in our lightest color on the top. Laid in nice and easy. So you want, in this case, I'm trying to do about a third with the lightest color. And then we have our middle color. And you kind of want to leave a little space in between. And that's our middle color. And then our darkest color. Now, could you mix the dark and the light directly there to make your middle color? You certainly could, and that's exactly what I did, is this is all based on the same dark. So the base color, this dark green, I just added white yep. more and more. And so, in terms of color terminology, we've got a tint, we've got a, sh uh, a tone, which is a mid-tone, and a shade down here. Yep. Uh, that's just describing the value of the lightness yes. of the... And so again, you're going to want a really soft bristle brush, something that's got a lot of play into it. You don't want a stiff brush. And very lightly, you're going to blend these colors together, keeping your hand moving, brushing in different directions. And you might have noticed that I used a, a stronger thicker paint for this, because I think it works a little better than trying to, to, to blend thin paint. Again, I like to keep my soft brush clean, so I and what you want to do is really kind of hypnotize that edge so you don't see. Now if you're working on a light background, you'll notice that the darkest color is going to be the one that doesn't cover very well. Um, and your lightest color covers great. Now again, if you use a dark base, your light cover is not going to cover very well, and your dark color is going to cover great. So um, it just depends on what you're looking for. Um, and if you don't like how it's working, you can add more paint. So if I don't like my dark color, I can go in with some more dark paint. But keep your hand moving. Keep your brush clean. And just keep working at it until you get what you want. Now it's possible to do this with a roller as well, especially on a large um, sky or a floor. It's the same kind of idea. 
you want levels of paint, and then you want to blend them together. It's a little tricky with a roller, but it can be done. So that's also an option. So that's basically what we're looking for. So we have a gradation from light to dark. And again, you can do it in different colors, uh, but you want a smooth transition from one color to the next. And once this is more dry, then we can uh, make sure it's what we want. And then we are done with gradient.